Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 75 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. For the first time ever, I've brought back a guest from an earlier episode. That's because not only was our first discussion a huge hit with my listeners, but also because he has many more stories to tell that we were unable to cover in our first interview. I'm talking today with Lee Gossett, who first appeared on episode number 13 over a year ago. Lee got his start as a smoke jumper with the U.S. Forest Service and later served with Air America during the Secret War in Laos and afterwards worked and flew all over the world. He's also the author of Smoke Jumper to Global Pilot, A True Odyssey. Last time around, we discussed Lee's service as a smoke jumper in the United States Forest Service and the six and a half years he spent in Laos, but we only spent a few minutes discussing the many years he spent flying in other remote corners of the world, and I thought it was high time to invite him back for another chat. So if you haven't already listened to episode number 13, I encourage you to pause this episode now and go back to listen to that one first, because we're going to skim over the topics he already described there, and believe me when I say you don't want to miss those stories. But before we dive into some more of Lee's adventures, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on Patreon, including Max E. and Christian S. Your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Lee, it's really good to talk to you again. I know that the listeners probably don't realize it, but we've been in touch quite a bit since your first appearance on the podcast. So I got to say, welcome back. Well, thank you, Justin. It's nice to be back and, and chat with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And you've been such a huge help. You've given me a lot of insights kind of behind the scenes that have really helped me out in a big way, you know, including putting me in contact with some other people who have, you know, shed light on a lot of things that have gone on. And, you know, that's all thanks to you all the way back at the beginning. So a big part of my kind of ability to continue to share these stories is because of you. So I really appreciate it. Well, you're more than welcome. So I've discussed first with you and then with somebody else as well with Toby, as a matter of fact, I've discussed smoke jumpers a couple of times in the past, but for the people who are just tuning in right now, can you just briefly describe what a smoke jumper is exactly? Well, a smoke jumper uh, parachutes out of airplanes over remote forest areas to fight fires that are inaccessible. You generally stay on the fire for several days until you're relieved by a ground crew. The smoke jumpers are predominantly in the West Coast and Alaska. And it was kind of a turning point in my life being a smoke jumper. It kind of opened the door for me to all of the uh, opportunities that came my way. Yeah, that seems to be the case from reading your book and from reading some of the other stories that came about. I have to ask, how exactly was it that the smoke jumper program exactly became a, what's the word, like a kind of a funnel into a lot of these operations that you took part in? Was it because of one or two individuals or was it a, like a program from the, the CIA, kind of an outreach program or recruitment program or something like that? Well, America was recruiting uh, former smoke jumpers and special forces operatives back in the early 60s to act as cargo droppers, or as they called them, air freight specialists in Laos. And I had three friends that went over to do this out of the Alaska crew. Unfortunately, two of them were, were killed in plane crashes. One was shot down and captured. Then they called me, but, you know, being young, single, broken, invincible, I went over. And I knew eventually I wanted to, I had a pilot's license in my ratings, but not enough flying time. So I went to Laos in January 1964, and my intention was to try and get on as a pilot. But after a year of kicking cargo and hard rice and soft rice ammo, 
I was told that there was just too many more qualified guys. So I left for about a year and a half and got some more experience. And then I came back as a pilot with Air America in late 1966. Wow. Okay. So that first tour there just kind of whet your appetite for a lot more over there? Oh, of course. Yeah. I just discovered there's a big, wide, wonderful world of adventure out there. And I just wanted my piece of it, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's understandable. How many people over there did you know at the time? Like, was it a pretty small community that you were working with right from the start? Yes. When I arrived up over there, there was several previous smoke jumpers I jumped with in Alaska were already there. More smoke jumpers joined the program after that. Most of the pilots with Air America during that time frame were uh, former military pilots. But when I hired on as a pilot in Saigon in 1966, I was number 633 on the seniority list, just to give you an idea oh how gosh. large Air America really was. Now, that encompassed Air America, Civil Air Transport, and Southern Air Transport, and included rotary wing pilots also. So it was quite a large operation. And after I left out of about a year and a half later, I was, I think I was 499 or something like that. Oh, wow. Was that attrition just due to people quitting and moving on? Or was it because of the, the rate of lost aircraft at the time? Well, it, it was mostly just attrition. You know, people would come and go. We lost a, a number of people when we were over there also. Yeah, yeah. I, I know I talked to you about it some and I talked to Neil Hansen. And in fact, I just, I think it was yesterday, I saw that Neil put on Facebook that yesterday was the 50th anniversary of him being shot down over there, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. And, you know, I had, was in communication with Neil here a while back. We, we stay in communication, but I asked him how many 123s were actually shot down or crashed or killed. And there was six. They only had 12. And he was oh the gosh. only one to ever survive. It was a shoot down and he bailed out with his crew. So he had a, he had a clover on his shoulder that day. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And by the way, for, for anyone who's tuning in and is not familiar with Neil Hansen, he was a previous guest of mine as well. I believe that was for episode five, maybe either four or five of the podcast. So you might also want to go back and listen to that one. He is he lived quite a life as well. So you spent six and a half years in Laos. And like we talked about in the previous episode, and after that, uh, did you go on to work Continually work with Air America, or did you try something else entirely for a little while? Well, I was with Air America as a pilot for about a year and a half. I was still months away from a checkout. So I went across the ramp and I flew for Continental Air Service, which was a division of Continental Airlines. And I flew Platus Porters for four years for them from 68 to 72. And then we left in 1972. Ah, okay. Okay. I see. And the, the Pilatus Porter is very small, right? Like I'm not an expert on airframes, but it's like a single engine, right? It's it's a Swiss built single engine stole airplane with a turbine engine, quite a large bulky airplane, 50 foot wingspan, amazing short field capability. And it was really the backbone of the single engine stole program for a number of years over there. Okay, I see. Was that because, well, the, the short takeoff and landing, I guess you were using mostly like unimproved kind of airstrips out in the middle of nowhere? That's correct. These were mostly handmade airstrips that the Hmong had chopped out and made on ridge lines in the interior of Laos. Now, we did fly all over the country. As far as north as Ban Hui Sai, which is up near the Golden Triangle, down to Pak Se, which is in the very southern area of Laos down near the uh, Cambodian Vietnam border. And we had about five different bases that we would go up and do five day tours at these different bases. Worked mostly for the CIA and you know, doing resupply drops, air to ground, some covert air stuff down in Southern Laos. But we were literally all over the place. Hmm. Sounds like, I mean, did you have a good idea of what was to come or did you just kind of, you know, never know what would, the next week would bring, for example? You never really knew. The seasons, we had dry season, rainy season, smoky season, and we would gain quite a bit of real estate during the dry season on the plane to Jars. But in the winter months, we would lose the area because we couldn't get in there to support it, and the North Vietnamese would flood into these areas. But it was kind of a back-and-forth thing. 
I think deep down we all saw the end game here, you know, and the North Vietnamese were pouring, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of troops in to Laos, and it was to protect the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was their supply line from Hanoi to South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that prior to the pullout, you could see the writing on the wall for, for how long would you say, like a year or two years or more? Well, I think for probably the last year or so, they were gaining more country. We were starting to lose more airplanes, you know, mainly the big airplanes, the transports, the 123s and the Caribous were, were taking a heavy hit. Mm, okay, I see. So you were, you were a very young man throughout all of this. Did you foresee yourself at that time? Did you see this as what you would continue to do for many years to come just in a general sense? Or did you think that this was, you know, an adventure and you would move back to a, a little bit more stability in the U.S. afterwards? Well, you know, a lot of us were just living for the moment. It was high adventure. We loved the work. We loved the people we were working with. The CIA uh, case officers were outstanding people. I am in contact with a number of them to this day. And it was very challenging work. We lost our share of very good people, but it was just kind of a kind of a junky high, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there is nothing else quite like the experiences that you can have in, in these kind of situations. It's, it's hard to compare it to anything else. So did you, how do I put this exactly? Did you really kind of like concern yourself with the larger picture in all of your work, or did you mostly just focus on like the immediate tasks at hand that needed to, you know, happen to accomplish the mission? Well, it was the immediate tasks, but later on, I think maybe you're familiar with the Lima Site 85 disaster up there. Yes. This was a, an advanced radar site putting in northern Laos that manned by sheep-dipped Air Force people that looked into North Vietnam and directed airstrikes. The North Vietnamese came in and scaled that one night and overran it and killed some Americans. I think there's still seven unaccounted for Americans on that. But we could see a real push, a real effort to capture Laos. And, you know, we started losing villages and we had to come back and we lost one of our main bases and we fell back to another base. I think you could just see the writing on the wall the way it was eventually going to go. And then I believe it was in 1974. Air America was the first one to be kicked out of Laos. Continental stayed on till the very end. I think they might have stayed till 75. Hmm. Then the whole country just fell to communism after that. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a tragedy. All of that was had some really, really long-term consequences for everybody there. And so many people here as well. So what did you do at that point? Did you start like actively looking for another mission or did the mission find you? Well, I knew that this wouldn't last forever. I had my wife and daughter over there with me. Life was ve really very comfortable in Vientiane where we were at. It was a neutral town. You know, we would shop shoulder to shoulder with the North Vietnamese, not necessarily the North Vietnamese, but the path at Lao. Oh, wow. Nobody caused a problem in town. It was just a neutral town. We all got on well. But once you left and headed up country, it was war on. Hmm. And so really, Vientiane was a very comfortable place to live. We had American embassy uh, AOPA privileges. We had a commissary over there. My wife shopped on the morning market quite a bit. She learned the language. But after a time, our daughter started having a few health issues, and we said, you know, it's time to leave. So I left and went back to New Zealand, where my wife is from. I'd met her there crop dusting in 1965. I flew there crop dusting, ski planes on the glaciers, and tourist airline work. And during their winter months, summer months in the States, I came back and flew a couple seasons for Intermountain Aviation, which I think you're familiar with. It was a CIA proprietary located in Marana, Arizona. And it went out of business. It folded in 1975, as did Air America. And literally, the agency had no air assets after about that. The, they just they pulled the plug on all their air assets. And then in 1978, they started rebuilding very, very quietly. And then I was called back on board in 79 with them got a hold of four of us that were originally Air America pilots and we were we came on board to be the the startup of the core air branch again. 
Wow, wow, wow. Okay, so you were one of their first choices then, one of their top picks once they decided to get back into that arena? Yes, because I had a lot of Platus Porter time. We worked a lot with the special forces out of Fort Bragg. I had like 5,000 hours of Porter time. And this was one of our main support platforms with special forces out of Fort Bragg. So my experience came in very handy. And that, that's really why they called me. And I, I knew a number of the CIA case officers who had been former smoke choppers. Mm. And I'd all, we'd all met up in Alaska in 1963. After that season, we all scattered to, you know, Air America, Intermountain, or CIA, but we would all meet up again back in Laos. Wow. 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 It's funny how it's, it is kind of a small world in so many ways. So what was the focus? You, you came on in, in the end of the 1970s. What was the CIA focused on at that time? Any one region in particular or all over? Well, we did a lot of work down in Central America during that time frame. That was kind of our main thrust down there. I was first deployed in 1981 to Salvador on a photo platform, taking photographs. We were trying to document San Anista infiltration into Salvador, which we did. We would do, you know, two, three months TDYs, and then we'd be replaced with somebody else. And then we'd go on to another posting or back to the States to do some more support work. But we were kept busy, and then we started going to other countries throughout the world. Hmm. Well, yeah, I know that you you traveled all over. So was it primarily Central America in the early to mid-1980s, or were you just called over like one month here and another month on the opposite side of the world, so to speak? Well, I did a a short tour in Saudi Arabia, but mostly it was down in Central America until the late late 1980s. Wow. But... Toward the end of that, I went into the uh, UAV programs and I worked in there for a few years. Oh, right. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that in a moment. I, I know that, of course, there was a huge amount of activity in Central America. It's come up more than once on the on the podcast in the past. So besides the the photo missions that you mentioned, were you also doing anything else like the more conventional resupply type missions or anything like that? Yes, it, I did a five-month TDY out of Honduras. And I supported the embassy efforts there. You know, I would haul people around and we kind of supported the Contras out there in, in Central, at Awakati. I was just all over Central America during that time, flying in support of the embassy and the station. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Aguacate, that actually just came up in another thing I was reading about recently. I know that there was, that was quite a hub of activity, activity at that time. So did you tend to spend like a lot of time, a lot of time up at the air? I mean, were th- was this like a high op tempo t- kind of mission typically when you were down there? No, it really wasn't. I flew probably five days a week. Most of my flying was Awakati or further out to Rus Rus to the eastern part of the country. And I would take case officers, em- embassy personnel around to the different locations and they would do their, uh, they would do their contact work. Mm, okay. If I recall correctly, since you mentioned Aguacate, was it John John Negroponte was down there at the time? Was he the ambassador? Did you have any interaction with him at all? You know, I the only interaction I had, there's a place called Bay Islands up there off the north coast of Honduras. And I flew up there with a radio opera technician to set up a, a radio. We had a couple of helicopters and they flew the ambassador up and his family to this one island. They went back up and picked him up, and I brought my radio technician back. But I don't remember the name of the ambassador at that time, but we did take him up there for kind of a four or five day holiday. Ah, okay. Okay, I see. So that, I mean, you really were supporting the the embassy in a big way in that yes. case. You were flying around mm-hmm. the ambassador. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So were you in the region at the time of that very famous shoot down incident where Eugene Hassenfuss survived and, and was captured? Were you present? No, I think that happened. I'm not sure, but I think about 1986, I believe. I'd been down to Honduras in 1985, and then I didn't come back till about 1987 to do a TDY. I, we'd all heard about it, but we weren't connected with that in any way. But as I'd mentioned before, I knew Gene Hausenfoss. He was a kicker with Air America when I was a, a pilot for Air America. Okay, so he eventually made it back to the U.S., and that was, I mean, it it seems like it was just quite a a mess in every way possible, but were you able to reconnect with him 
afterwards? I mean, did he seem like the same person that you knew before after that event? Well, I only met him once after that. Air America, we had a uh, reunion in 2008 in Portland, Oregon. A lot of the kickers showed up and Gene was there and I got to meet him again and talk to him. But we didn't really go over anything. We just shook hands. Hi, how are you? You know. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Okay. So did you spend a lot of time, would you say, down there interacting with the locals or were you mostly just within, I don't want to call it a bubble, but were you just kind of kept separate from them and working, you know, closely with your own teammates? It was pretty much our own people. I did interact with the folks out at Awakati a little bit, but it was mainly just hauling our people around and supporting them, whatever whatever they needed. Okay. Okay. I see. Was that still in the same airframe or were you flying something different at that time? I was flying a Cessna 185 down there. Mm. Wonderful airplane. Had good range on it. And it was just a, an ideal airplane for that. I could go into very small strips. We also had strips up between uh, Salvador and Honduras that I would support the, the state case officers over there that were on duty. But I, I went into, you know, Salvador, Guatemala. I was just all over the place, kind of a kind of a taxi sort of a guy. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I, did it ever feel like a routine? Did it ever become like a, a dull kind of thing? I mean, it doesn't seem like it could from my perspective, but you've got, you know, thousands and thousands of air, hours in all these different airframes. So, I mean, did it ever become routine to you? No, it never did. Hmm. Uh, every day I flew was something different, hauling the different embassy and agency people around and going into interesting places. It was really a very, very enjoyable tour down there. Yeah, it's it's just really hard to imagine something more exciting and dynamic than the kind of work that you've done over all these years. So after Central America, you moved on, was it to Somalia in the early 1990s? Yes, I went over there, I think it was 93. I was over there right after Black Hawk Down, and I was flying the Schweitzer. It's a motorized glider. It was a quiet bird. We had one over there. I only flew at night. I flew with night vision goggles. I had a flare operator with me, forward-looking infrared. And I'd take off at, at night from Mogadishu, go out over the water, which we were right on the beach there, climb up to altitude and go into quiet mode, which is about 1,200 RPM. I just kind of loiter back over the, the town of Mogadishu. We had a, an assignment, kind of a flight plan from the embassy where they wanted us to go. We had different points within the Mogadishu city area to check out that they'd had reports on of unrest and everything. But one of the things we were trying to locate were these things called technicals. They were like Toyota pickups with machine guns mounted in the back. Mm -hmm. And because I was wearing night vision goggles, they measured light. I could see flashes coming out of warehouses and things where the FLIR couldn't see that. The FLIR only measures heat. So between the two of us, we could pretty much document and identify everything. And we were doing uh, direct voice communication with the embassy during these flights. And they're seeing everything we're seeing. We're doing a direct downlink of our video right to them. And we were also doing a reel-to-reel -reel recording on board the airplane. They would say, well, go over and what's going on over there? Well, circle around there. We'll zoom in on that, you know. So we really had a, a good platform overhead at night. I'd only fly about maybe three hours every night. It didn't take long to get around to the city. The Schweitzer was a very unique airplane. I wouldn't say it was enjoyable to fly. It was, you know, a glider flies in a very narrow band between stall and flight. And when you have it all throttled back to about 1200 RPM to reduce your noise signature, I mean, you're flying it the whole time. You really are. Hmm. Okay. So I'm, I'm not really familiar with them, but my, my thought as a kind of as a layman was, you know, a glider is a, is a unpowered aircraft, you know, that is towed up into to altitude or something. So a motor gr glider, what makes it a motor glider as opposed to just a, a standard powered aircraft exactly? Well, this had a, like a 300 horse Lycoming engine on the front of it. You could ink out about 10 hours of, of endurance if you really brought it back. But like I say, it was, we had a long extended exhaust that ran down the side of the fuselage to help dissipate the propeller and engine noise. Well, the engine noise, the propeller, nothing you can do about that except reduce the RPM. Hmm. But we'd just simply loiter about, gather as much intelligence as we could. 
Wow. Wow. Did you have to take off and land at night just to keep your presence unknown there? Oh, yeah. Every every takeoff and landing was at night with the night vision goggles, yes. Boy, that, that sounds very, very intense to me. I mean, I'm sure you had a lot of practice, but that that's really something else. I'll tell you a real quick funny story one night. Sure. I was out there flying, and all of a sudden, I am lit up about a square block. It's just daylight, and I go, my God. I threw my goggles up, and it's dark. I put my goggles back down, and I'm lit up. And now then I knew there's like an Air Force C-130 overhead that had seen me and lit me up to get a better picture. And we had voice comma with them, and they called me up. I had a call sign I was using, and they wanted to know what kind of an airplane I was. They'd never seen anything like this before. Well, I thought I'd jerk their chain a little bit, and I said, well, it's a PLM-4B. And I know these guys are flipping through their books trying to find out what that was. Well, it stands for Power Lawnmower Four Bladed. I thought I'd just screw <laughs> with them a little bit. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, must have had them scratching their heads, like you said. <laughs> wow, I had never even heard of the Schweitzer until you mentioned it to me a couple of days ago. And apparently, there were just there were not very many of these made, were there? I think there were ten. The uh, U.S. Coast Guard flew them. And the Colombian Air Force flew them down there on their drug identification program. You can look them under under Wikipedia. They have Condor. It was a SA-237AB, the one we flew. But it was a very simple airplane. It was very mission-specific. We had a very good ratio of, of intel to cost on that airplane. Hmm. I can imagine. So because it was a glider, was it much slower than a lot of the other airframes that were flying at that time? Oh, yes. Yeah, this was just, I forget the airspeed, but it was, we're flying at under 100 miles an hour. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and we're just loitering crazy. around up there just to preserve mm -hmm. fuel and to be as quiet as we can. Okay. Was it, were you by yourself? Was it single seat? I had a, a FLIR operator that sat next to me and the FLIR operator would control just the forward looking infrared. And okay. we, we would talk back and forth on a hot mic and we would, we would, we had the, the FLIR screen between us and we could point on that. And then I, I would see something and the FLIR operator would beam the, the FLIR over to that. And they'd go zoom in. They could also click hot, hot black, hot white or whatever it was. But everything we were doing in the embassy was seeing the same thing. Hmm. Okay. And so you mentioned earlier, you mentioned that you could use the night vision to see what the activity in the warehouses. Like what was the activity that you were watching exactly? Well, I could see arc welder flashes. Being an old farm boy, I've done a lot of arc welding. I could see this flashing come out. It was always hot there, coming out of an open door, you know, an open to like a garage door. Mm -hmm. So we knew that at this time of night, somebody doing an arc welder is building something that's that's bad, you know. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic indicator that probably nobody else would really think of, but it makes perfect sense there. And this was... After the October of 93, the, the events of Black Hawk Down, like you mentioned. So yes. as I, I don't know the whole timeline exactly, but a lot of U.S. forces pulled out not too long after that, correct? I mean, was there a large presence, like a reaction force that could do something about these technicals, or were you just gathering information solely? You know, I was gathering information, but the 10th Mountain was there with helicopters. They even had, if you can believe this, some Abram tanks parked down there. Hmm. And they had the United Nations troops were there, and the Italians were there. The, some of these other countries were there with their people. But we were restricted just to the airport. I mean, you couldn't even drive to the embassy. We had to, which was across town, we had a helicopter that would fly over daily and take the case officers over for briefings I just and supplies and things like that. Has this podcast given you a renewed interest in the history of the Cold War? Do you want to share that interest with others? Well, now there's a fun and interactive way to introduce your family and friends to the topic. I'm talking about 15-Minute Cold War, a new strategy-based card game for up to four players. As one of the great powers during the Cold War, use your armed forces to attack opponents while defending yourself with military, scientific, and economic assets. There are also wild cards based on real events and people to keep things interesting. For example, how will Oleg Penkovsky weaken one side or strengthen another? Players don't have to know any history to start playing, just learn the color codes and point values of each card. 
My eight-year-old daughter understood the game mechanics within a few minutes and has already won two rounds against her mom and I. There's also an expansion edition available for game nights of up to eight players. Find it at 15mincoldwar.com. That's 15mincoldwar.com. And make sure to follow at 15 Minute Cold War on Instagram. Okay, okay, I've got you. And how long were you in Somalia overall? Well, I was there Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. And I came back, I think it was probably mid-January. A few months later, I went to Columbia on the Schweitzer. I was down oh, there no. for a couple of weeks. We were doing the same thing, only we were looking for drug drug processing labs. You could get a heat signature off of them in remote areas. Really? From the, I don't know, the, the cooking of the drugs or whatever? I don't really know yes. how those work. Right. Uh-huh. Okay. So the, the FLIR was more useful in those situations than the night vision goggles, I guess? Yes, it was. Now down there, it's a very remote jungle area where they're doing this. You can run that FLIR around and you can find a hot spot in a, just a minute, you know? Then hmm. you zoom in on it, you can actually see the figurine of a person walking around. You can see fires and and you can kind of get a good a good look at what kind of a processing plant they have. Oh, wow. Were you able to kind of like vector in ground troops or anything like that? Or did this just go exclusively for information gathering again? Well, it was information gathering. You know, we would turn it in. What they did with it, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I know that we've, I mean, had a heavy presence in Colombia for many years, and there was a lot that was done to kind of dismantle the FARC group down there, but it doesn't seem like the drug trade has been, you know, eliminated in the same way that, that FARC was mostly defeated. So do you have any, any thoughts on that? Was it because of, you know, lack of willpower, or did they change their tactics to, you know, keep the, the drug labs and the processing plants hidden or, or something else? Well, the, the the drug lords, so to speak, they were hiring the FARC as protection down there. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But the last number of years, the Colombian government got very serious about the FARC and really started decimating them. And once they did that, then the FARC wanted to come to the table and kind of negotiate a, a ceasefire or a peace or something like that. So from what I gather, things have cooled off down there as far as FARC activity. I don't know that it's gone away, but one of their big things down there was capture. You know, they'd capture celebrities. And I do know that there was a a caravan went down with some guys on board. And I I knew these guys and they were prisoners for five years until they were rescued. And they lost another caravan, a a caravan down there when everybody died. They just flew through a mountain. Hmm. Yeah, that that was going to be my next question because I have the book that they wrote, the Out of Captivity book. It was... Stancil and Gonzalez and Howells, and I was going to ask if they were, you know, friends of yours, and it sounds like you did know them. So were you able to get in touch with them after they were rescued? I mean, have you talked to them since that event? Yes, I, I talked to one of them. I was back in Florida. There was a Air America breakfast at this one location outside of Orlando. Met up with one of the guys there that had been one of the prisoners. Hmm. We were able to sit there and talk and reminisce and everything. And I used to, you know, we, I parked my King Air right next to them, and they'd go out just about every night and fly a surveillance down there. And I think mm-hmm. I think they were looking for, for drug labs also. I, I believe that was their mission. I, I think that's what I read, but I haven't looked at it in quite some time, to be honest. But yeah, I, I know that there... There was there was a fourth American on the plane with them, and he was and he died either in the crash or was executed right afterwards, wasn't he? He was executed right after that, and I knew him really well. Oh, really? Uh, okay. And that was very sad. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Lee, does this kind of thing, I mean, you, you must just, what's the word I'm looking for here? I mean, it, does it feel like that is just a part of the cycle of these events, you know, that you are going to lose friends, you know, that people that you've known for many years, they might go off on another, you know, somewhere else that you're not there and you might not see them again? I mean, is that is that something that you just accepted a long time ago or or... Or what exactly? Like, what's your mindset with all of that? I, I, you just accept it. You know, you just go on uh, and do your mission and to the best of your ability. And I guess things happen. And you'd like to contribute a lot of this to skill and cunning. But, you know, to pardon my words, but I've had a lot of blind ass luck over the years, too, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the places that you've been and the and the amount of time that you have spent in the pilot seat, like you said, and the, the missions and, you know, everything, like you said, you know just the nighttime missions and all that. I mean, it's, I'm 
very, very surprised that you were able to keep it up as long as you did and, and come through to the other end, honestly. And maybe maybe you feel that way as well. Well, I was very, very fortunate. I really was. Yeah. Are you still flying now? Do you still get yes, up Yes. I've got a Piper Super Cub. And I fly to the Idaho backcountry every uh, summer and enjoy the backcountry remote flying. Go to some nice challenging airstrips and meet some really interesting people. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I love flying. I I first started 1954. I was a gas boy and just a grunt. I worked all one summer for no money in exchange for a private license. It's just been in my blood ever since, you know? Oh, wow. Boy, well, that was... <laughs> That was quite a return on your investment in that case, if that's what led to you getting your pilot's license in the first place. Yeah, well, I was one of those kids that I just always had this thing about airplanes, you know? Mm-hmm. And some guys have cars, and but mine has been airplanes, you know? How many different aircraft are you qualified to fly? I know it's a big number. You know, I'm guessing that I've flown about either around 50 to 70 different types of airplanes that oh. I... I've never really totaled it up, you know, <laughs> but just a little bit of everything. Wow. Okay. And rotary wing as well, right? You've, you've flown helicopters at one point or another? You know, I've got a little bit of time in them, but I'm not qualified. In Honduras, we had a couple of Hueys. I'd go along as what I call a sandbag co-pilot and they let me fly, you know, hmm. but flying, flying helicopters is a totally different, <laughs> different thing. I'll oh, tell yeah. you. And my <laughs> hat goes off to these guys now. I got to know a lot of former Air America and helicopter pilots. And these guys were the best of the best. And boy, they paid a heavy price over there too, you mm. know. Yeah. But my hat goes off to helicopter pilots. Yeah, same here, same here. That's what a job that is. So, Lee, earlier you mentioned UAVs. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, in 1983, I think it was, they were looking for a volunteer to be a kind of a company representative on a UAV program. And it was out on the West Coast. So I said, oh, I'll go do it. You know, my my dad lived in the Southern Oregon. So I went out and did that. And it was a it was a Cessna aircraft, Cessna 210 that was remoted. And its mission was there was a, there was a like a travel trailer that was a ground station. And it would beam up to a, an orbiting uh, King Air at like 23 to 25,000. And that would relay on over to the UAV. You could actually, we could fly it like over 200 miles from the ground station through the relay platform. We would load its flight plan. And once it dropped out of data and video link, it would go autonomous and it would complete its route and come back to a certain point and we would pick it up. That platform never went operational. Several years later, we had another one that that came up. And since I'd been on the first one, they sent me out again to the West Coast to be the test pilot, safety pilot on the, the Eagle. It was, a, it was a, a rutan, all composite, long easy that had been converted with a nose camera. It had a revised exhaust stack that would expel exhaust into the air to reduce its heat signature. And th- this, this was basically the same thing, a ground station to a relay airplane onto the long easy. And it would drop link, fly its course, and come back and link up, and then you'd land it. This particular program, we had a couple of pylons underneath the wings. We had a couple of these bomb racks mounted there. We mounted these things that we called RDOs. They were called red droppable objects. It was nothing more than galvanized pipe, about three feet long, with fins and painted red. We did a A test flight early one morning at the contractor's facility and something we'd never done before. I took off, linked up, and I said, you've got it. Just fly it remotely. And I said, on my command, I want you to drop individually each wing. So I says, okay, drop the left one. I looked out, the way it went. Now drop the right one, and away it went. So that was really a milestone right there. That's the first time that ever a dummy rocket had ever been launched remotely from a UAV, and that program led led to the Predator program. Well, you were right there at the, the birth of the Predator program, and this is back in, it began in 83, so when did you drop the, the RDS? That was 1986, 86, and, and it was, we called it the Radio Shack UAV, very, <laughs> very low budget, 
And we do our R&D work over a napkin at breakfast and we go out and try something. And well, that didn't work, did it? Let's try something else. <laughs> oh my gosh, what a heck of a way to put something together. But it sounds like it, it certainly paid off in the yes, end. Yes, it did. Yeah. In 86, I mean, UAVs were not in any way in the kind of the in the, the forefront of the mind of the public by then it was what, 15, 16, 18 years later that, you know, they kind of took center stage in our conflicts all over the world, but yeah. 86, I can't believe it. that's amazing. So and how back, long did you... uh, back then you can only fly a remote UAV in the restricted airspace. You could not fly it like they do today. We had a, an area in Northern area 51 that we did our acceptance test work back there on it. Oh man, Area 51. I'm sure a lot of my listeners just perked up right now. So did you spend a lot of time there at Area 51 or was it just for this one particular program? Well, I can't really go into that much, but I did spend <laughs> time there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I understand. I know there's always some kind of left and right limits on what we can talk about in a lot of these interviews, unfortunately, but I appreciate you dropping the hint at least. That's going to be a endlessly fascinating subject for so many people. But this program had its birth then at Area 51. Is that about about right, the Eagle program? We did our acceptance work there. We had two of these Eagles in, in the program, and we had a relay airplane, and it was all part of the package. One of the stipulations on the contract, it had to make at least one totally remote UAV flight. We did it, and it was at a place called Dugway, which is the very northern end of that restricted area. Mm, okay. And, uh, I've, I've heard of that. I've, I've never been anywhere close to there. Dugway Proving Grounds. Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I know a lot of fascinating stuff goes on there as well. So after the UAV program, where did you move on to from there? Well, from there, I spent an awful lot of time in South America, Bolivia, Peru, and Colombia. Most of my time was spent in Colombia. And, mm. and again, all of those flights down there were in a King Air. I was just supporting the, the embassy station people, transporting them and cargo around the country. And it was a pretty cushy job, really, you know. Yeah, that's the first cushy job you've had your whole life is what it sounds like to me. Well, I, I really enjoyed my time in, in South America and especially Colombia. I lived in Bogota, met some very good friends down there that I still keep in contact with. We had excellent support down there and we flew all over the country down there. Again, supporting the, the embassy people, agency people. It was just a, it was a good, it was a good tour. It really was. Good, good. You know, you mentioned earlier that your family was with you in Vincin for years. So during all of your, your travels around, are they living in the U.S. or do they come with you on occasion? Well, no. I, when I deploy, I would deploy. One trip, I finished up and my wife was able to come down. I did, at our, I'd already retired after that and our 40th wedding anniversary, I took my wife down to Columbia. I was no longer, you know, associated. And, but I had some very good friends down there in the Colombian <clears throat> circuit. And we had a wonderful time. She got to meet these people that she'd only heard about, you know. But what was kind of funny is her friends said, now why is Lee taking you to the murder kidnap capital of the world? You know. <laughs> Well, I guess she likes to keep that stuff, doesn't want to have that stuff in the front of her mind normally, I yeah. suppose. But I guess she's used to you going to some very dangerous places and always coming back home. Yeah, you know that I, I've just got, I've been married to this wonderful lady for 57 years now. And she's just been the rock. She's just never, she's never wavered. So I, I owe her a lot. Well, yeah, that is, that is truly priceless. I mean, there's a lot of families out there, of course, especially since 2001 or so that, you know, the spouse goes off on a deployment and, and comes back home, but you just did it so many times over and over again for, for decades. I mean, she is really, really a very strong person to be able to put up with all of that, I would imagine, as are you. So, I mean, I know this is not really about your, your personal family or anything, but what kept you guys going? Was it just good communication or was it just, you know, her knowing that you'd always come back as soon as you could or what exactly? That seems like a very difficult way to well, we just had a it. wonderful relationship, you know, and mm -hmm. we, we both, st she was a flight attendant when I met her and I was a crop duster in New Zealand. She had no idea what was ahead of her. I'll tell you that. But anyway, 
we ha- we've had a wonderful relationship, and our, and, our, and our, we got one daughter. She was with us in Laos. She had her first birthday over there. She is quite a gal. She's got her own family, and we've got grandkids. We've got two grandkids. Andy is a senior in college. He is a Eagle Scout. He's an EMT with the local fire department up there, and he's a wildland hotshot firefighter in the summertime, and he's going to graduate from college this year. We have a granddaughter that goes to the University of Oregon, and she's a sophomore, and we're going to all gather up again at Christmas time up in Portland area. Hmm. That's fantastic. The family's most important thing for sure, despite it all. So Lee, you mentioned that you had a story from Puerto Rico that might be a good one to share. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Okay. <clears throat> we worked a lot with special forces and Delta special operations people. And I was deployed to Fort Bragg to pick up a team and take them to Puerto Rico. I was told it was a practice hostage rescue scenario. And I loaded these guys up there on civilian clothes and they're packing machine guns and I launched out of Fort Bragg. I flew down. I launched late at night, and I was supposed to go into this one strip night, covertly, lights off, no lights on the airplane, no landing lights, and land on five beanbags at this remote strip. Now, I'd been into this strip before, and I knew about it. And I'm in the King Air, and we had a four-minute window. where, Whenever we did this with special forces, you know, you got to it's two minutes before the hour, two minutes after the hour, and you have to be there during that time frame. Well, I got out there to my IP and I started in and I'm programming my nav system and I fly and fly and no lights are on. So I take a wave off and go back out to my initial point. I start in again. Now the lights are popping up. There's five beanbags on the ground. The first two beanbags are right at the end of the runway. The third one is on the left side, a third of the way up. That's your touchdown zone. And there's two beanbags at the far end. So I came in, there's the beanbags. I landed. I turned around real quick. The door went down. These guys just jumped out and away they went. Door slammed and I threw the coal and I took off. And I went into the neighboring uh, town and shut down. I expect this one sergeant to be there. But it took a long time. Finally, he showed up. And he says, Lee, you're not going to guess what happened. I said, what happened? He said, man, they almost got you. He said, the minute you threw the coal to take off, your headlights are all over the place. And the Puerto Rican military just drew down on all of us. They thought it was a drug deal going down. (laughs) But I got out of there. Here they are, civilian clothes packing machine guns. See, So the team leader gave him a phone number to call. Well, this sergeant had called the Puerto Rican commander and got everything cleared what they were going to do but he forgot to tell the team on the ground there so anyway three or four days later I had to go back out and pick them up at night like two in the morning whenever I worked with these guys I'd always throw a case of Coors Light in there and a a stack of donuts or something took off went out there and here's the beanbag lights and I landed and these guys get on board and they are dirty and they are scruffy and they just, they're tired and they're just wrung out. Again, it's civilian clothes packing machine guns. So I take off, I get altitude, and I program my flight plan into Florida and on up the coast. And all of Florida is down in weather. I go, man, I've got no alternate. So I turn around, landed back at San Juan. I got it. It's now it's like three in the morning. And I said, you guys stay in on board. Don't even go out because if they see you, the cops are going to be here, you know. (laughs) So we refueled it and I took off. I got to altitude, checked the weather. Now everything is fine. So I proceeded straight on to Fort Bragg and offloaded them and we all had a a good goodbye and everything. But I really enjoyed working with these guys. These were the ultimate professionals and they were, I was just a, a real treat to work with them. Yeah, I bet. And you, and you said you had a lot of opportunities like that with these guys? Yes. Now, I did a lot of, for about four years, I was the primary stole porter, porter pilot and twin otter pilot working out in uh, Fort Bragg. I'd go out there and do a day operation with these guys. And I'd do message pickups. I'd do stole landings. I'd do cargo drops and stuff. And then at night, we would do exactly the same thing again with the five beanbag lights. Really enjoyed that. Just some great guys to work for. 
Another little quick humor story picked up. They take some of these airmen, the, the pilots out of Pope Air Force Base, and they'd chuck them out in the in the bush up there in the Eora Forest, and they'd run them around, chase them, you know, E and E, and Special Forces guys would grab them and haul them around all over the place. They had no idea where they were, where they're going. And I came into this one strip in the porter at night and whipped around and the door opened. They threw these two guys in the back and they had no idea what's going on. I took off and I'm boiling back to Fort Bragg. And I kind of leaned back and I thought, I'm going to have a little fun here. So I said, guys, I'm sorry, but they say you got to go back and repeat this operation, you know? <laughs> And this one pilot looked at me and says, sir, have you ever tried talking with your throat slit? <laughs> and I said, just kidding, just kidding. I see the lights of the lights of Pope Air Force Base. So we landed and they said, you ever come down here? The drinks are on us at the old club, you know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, boy, you're just the right guy in the right place at the right time. Wow. Lee, what a what a tremendous number of stories you've got. And I know that there's a lot of stories that you are unable to tell even now. Do you anticipate that you might be able to write another book or that those stories might be declassified or anything at, at some point in the near future? Or, or is that, you know, is the door kind of closed on that? Well, you know, my book, Smoke Trapper to Global Pilot, it's just about to be released in uh, Kindle form through Amazon. Oh, fantastic. And it's on, it's on eBay also. But I had to run that through the Publication Review Board at CIA. And they kind of took the ax to a lot of it that I couldn't print. And I honored that. But there's some things that I'm going to write for internal use, you know. But, but as far as another book goes, no, this, this, is, this is my dash right here. Gotcha, gotcha. When you say internal use, you mean like, like CIA documents, you mean, for their yes, lessons learned and right. that kind of thing? Okay, mm -hmm. I've got you. I've got you. So you still have some of that to write then, even now? Yeah, I've written some of it down, but during the Contra years and all that, we were back and forth a lot. We ran a lot of missions, and none of these were really ever put down on paper, you know. And I and I know there's a an effort of being put forth right now to kind of gather all this information into some kind of a, a history packet, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I, I certainly hope that more of that gets released in the future. I mean, but it could be, gosh, it could be years and years. They, they're certainly not, they, they certainly don't do that in a speedy kind of fashion, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got your book right now, Lee. I've got it in my hand, as a matter of fact, Smoke Jumper to Global, Global Pilot. You said it's on eBay. Is it still available through the Smoke Jumpers website or only on eBay at the moment? It's only on eBay, but it's going to be released. Now, the printed version was through the Smoke Jumper Association. Okay. But okay. they're very, very busy. And well, you can get them through jumpergoods.com. This is a Jumper direct goods. link to okay. the Smoke Jumper. And they have them there. But as far as the printed version through Amazon, they don't carry it. But as I mentioned, the Kindle version will be available soon. Great. Do you, do you have a date for that already? I'd love to make sure, you know, share that wide. No, but I can share that with you later on. I've got a very good friend that I flew with, with the outfit. And he's a published author, and he's handling this for me. He's he's very okay. good at that. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Please do that after we get offline here. That's great. And then I'll share it once it's actually available because, you know, that's the easiest way for people to buy it, which means that's the way that most of them will probably end up yeah. getting it. But I'll also link up jumpergoods.com. You mentioned we'll put that in the show notes as well, and I'll share that around. I've been to the Smoke Jumper site, but not to Jumper Goods, I don't think. So I'll check okay. that out myself. Well, if you go to the Smoke Jumper site, you can look under books and DVDs, and it's there. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll definitely find it. I mean, I've got a copy already, but I know a lot of other people would love to read about this as well. Mm -hmm. And you've got quite a few photos in there as well, which, which you know, everybody loves to see, of course. So, Well, besides... it's, it's kind of ironic, but my book is available at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Oh. Imagine wow. that. Okay, great. Yeah, they have a big gift shop there, is it? So it must be down there. They have an extensive library in the gift shop. Yes. There's a lot of fantastic right. stuff. Yeah. Good, good. Well, yeah, I know a lot of my people go down there whenever they get the chance, so I'll make sure to mention that as well. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that you travel to Idaho every summer. What else are you up to these days? Well, gee, that's kind of it. I just do a lot of tinkering. We've got a log cabin in the mountains. It's about an hour's drive. We built it ourselves. Off-grid, solar, hydro, very comfortable, and it's right on the Rogue River. It's located halfway between Medford, Oregon, and the Crater Lake in the mm. beautiful section of the, of the Rogue River. Boy, that sounds nice. That sounds really nice. 
That's terrific. Well, Lee, this has been wonderful. Again, I, I certainly hope that you can share some more stories one day in the future. I know that you've got an awful lot more than we've gone over now, but I, I certainly appreciate everything that you shared. And like I said before, you know, I've gotten more feedback about your episode than just about any of the others. I mean, it really struck a chord with a lot of people. They can't get enough of these aviation stories. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you for coming back once again. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate, and I've, I've watched a number, listened to a number of your podcasts and and they're just riveting. And, you know, you did a good one with a friend of mine, uh, you know, Rick Prado. Now, this, yes. he tells an amazing story. Rick and I never met in the field, but we I know we passed in the middle of the night. I know that, hmm. you know. And he yeah, wrote yeah, a great must have, book. I mean, a lot of the places you were talking about. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, he wrote a great book, Black Ops, that's out there. Mm-hmm. Yep, I've got that one on my shelf as well. I've got a lot, a lot of books on my shelf these days, as a matter of fact. And I, I've, I've read many of them, and he is... His is one of my favorite, honestly. He's got a lot of redacted portions in it, you know, so some of the yes. key details are left out, but mm-hmm. that's what you have to do to get published. Well, I wished I had done what he did, and I would have had the redacted portions in my book, you know, which mm-hmm. would tell the reader there's something that they didn't want out. But but he mm-hmm. went ahead and did that, and after the fact, I thought, man, I wished I'd have done that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty smart, and it's, you know, it's it's good because you can include a lot of stuff, and also, you know, I think it really kind of stirs the imagination of the reader as well, you know, because it pulls back the curtain just enough to really, you know, get them, yes. get them interested. Right. So yeah. That's great. But, you know, we've gotten to hear a lot of your stories here, just like in the book. So, you know, I really appreciate you sharing all this stuff, Lee. Thank you. Well, Justin, thank you so much. And I really appreciate being asked back. This is very kind of you. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll stay in touch. Okay. Okay. Bye for now. All right. Thanks, Lee. Take care. Bye. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my pages on Instagram at Spycraft 101 and at cold.war.stamps. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.